Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on when you're joining us today. Maybe you are virtually visiting our church for the first time today, or maybe you have been a member of this church for a while now. Perhaps you are watching this service from your comfy living room in your pajamas, or maybe you're driving to work. Whoever you are and wherever you come from, we welcome you here to the University Baptist Church. I would like to open today's worship service with the biblical meaning of the word church. In the New Testament, the Greek translation of church is ecclesia, which means the called out ones. In other words, in the Bible, a church is not a small building, but a large community of individuals called out by God. Brothers and sisters, even though we are not all physically together today for worship, we are still connected by the kingdom of God. We are the church itself. We pray that this service comforts you right where you are, inspires you, and heals you both physically, emotionally, and spiritually. May this hour fill you with the presence of God and the joy of God. And may your internet connection remain strong. <laughs> Today, we have a quick announcement from our church's communications committee. If you are watching our worship service from Facebook right now, we ask that you share the service on your personal Facebook page. If you're watching this service from a computer or other smart device, we ask that you leave a review on University Baptist Church on Yelp or on our Facebook page if you have Facebook, after viewing. This is one quick and easy way you can share your faith with your friends and family, as well as help others find our church community. Good morning. I want to share a meditation today from a man we've seen and heard a lot about this week in the funeral for John Lewis and in all the observance of his life. This was his statement of faith. The power of faith is transformative. It can be utilized in your own spiritual life to change your individual condition, and it can be used as a lifeline of spiritual strength to change a nation. This morning, we pray that this service will help change all of our lives and draw us closer to God that we might be of greater influence in sharing the gospel in this world. Let's take just a moment of silence to gather ourselves and bring ourselves fully here as we've been called to do as we worship God together. We'll have a moment of silence. Oh God, we open our hearts and our minds, our lives to you, asking you to do what only you can do, change us from the inside out, and use us to be transformative people in this world of yours by sharing the gospel with all of our hearts, minds, souls, and bodies. In Christ's name we pray, amen. We invite you to join us now as we sing Higher Ground.
Now it's time for our praise for good news. A few years ago, Trinity Jagdio's best friend, Alexis, was diagnosed with a rare degenerative disease. As she comforted her friend, Trinity soon realized that Alexis had no hero she could relate to due to her disability. After reaching out to Disney multiple times without any reply, Trinity decided to begin writing and illustrating her own superhero books that featured special needs kids in order to inspire and encourage children with disabilities all across the United States. So far, Trinity has written three books. Her dream is to continue writing books in hopes to comfort and magnify the voices of children like her friend who are rarely included in superhero books or movies. Now we have come to the time of our service for our morning prayer and as usual we want to reach out to all those who are sick, those who are shut in, those who are, are not able and also we want to make sure that we reach out to caregivers, to those who are on the front line, those who risk their own safety to help others. We ask a special prayer for them and if you know of someone and you haven't heard, give people a call. We need to make sure we check on seniors, check on just your next door neighbor. You haven't seen them in a while, knock on the door. Hopefully you are friends. <laughs> <laughs> but we need to make sure that we uh, look out for another, one another during these times. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we know you are a healing you are a healing force in our lives. We know that you're patient with us. We know that you will hear us whatever we call. We know that you will be there for us. You help us with our faith when it's in doubt. You give us words to read that will strengthen us through the course of our day. If it's no more than I am with you, my child. Dear God, these are troubling times, we know that, but they are also times of joy because we know that we have a Father. We have someone we can go to at any point or time, day or night, and just say thank you for what you've done for me. We are grateful, dear God, that you are present in our lives, always. And then, Heavenly Father, we ask you to give us the courage to not only talk what we talk, but to be able to walk and to, to carry ourselves in a manner that will be pleasing to you, to do the things that you would want us to do, to reach out to one another, to help serve one another, and above all, to try to love one another as much as you love us. It's a tall order, dear God, but we know we're not alone in our journey. And for this, we're just truly, truly thankful. We ask you to continue to bless our church as we go about the business of trying to do what is right in your eyes to serve you, not only in this building, but in our hearts. Give us the right direction, dear God. This we pray. And now, let us say the prayer that Jesus told his disciples when they all gathered and said, Our Father, who art in heaven, I'll be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory.
before I bring our offertory prayer, I want to say just a few things about what we've been able to do because of your gifts and your faithfulness in this time. We have been able to send $1,000 to help other areas of this wor uh, world within our denomination who are suffering from things related to COVID-19, and we hope to send more in the days to come. We've also helped several families in our church who are not earning an income and struggling to pay the bills and make ends meet. And we're also uh, helping now three households who normally eat at Community Cafe. Community Cafe is shut down and so they've lost a meal every day. So our church is sending three of those household grocery cards every week to try to supplement a little bit uh, for their lack of that uh, meal. Uh, we'll be doing other things as we have resources and time, so please continue to give as you uh, can. You've been faithful through this time, and we truly appreciate it, and count on that faithfulness to go forward with all the work of this church. Speaking of the work of the church, I wanted to show you these prayer shawls. Many of you have received a prayer shawl uh, or given one to someone. They're beautiful. They're created by uh, members of our church, and then they are dedicated in a worship service, and they are sent out to people who are going through real crisis, the loss of someone they love, severe illness, uh, things like that that bring great worry uh, to, to the human heart. And the people we send them to uh, are referred to us by you. And they don't have to be members of the church. That's, uh, I think, a misconception. They can be anybody in your life who you know right now needs a special touch from God. And so if you would call the church office or maybe when you turn in a prayer request, you could also say, could I get a prayer shawl sent to this person? And we'll do our best to meet those needs. They are beautiful and they convey the presence of God to people who truly need that presence. So let us know if there's someone who needs a prayer shawl and we will send it to them. Let's now pray and ask God to bless all of our gifts, whether they're monetary or whether they're prayer shawls or whether they're acts of service. We take all this and offer it to our God. Would you join me in prayer? Oh God, we thank you for the resources you place in our stewardship. And we know that sometimes, God, we confess to you that we're not such great stewards. We use those resources to do trivial things or even destructive things. And we need to change that. But sometimes, oh God, we do the right thing. And so we come with the offerings that we gather through the week, online and in the mail, and we dedicate them all to you. We dedicate all the prayer shawls and the ministry of the prayer shawls to you. We dedicate the grocery cards we send out and the other money we send around the country uh, to you. And ask that you'll multiply it and use it for your service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. And now hear the letter of Paul to Titus. The book of Titus, chapter 3, verses 3 through 9. For we ourselves were once foolish disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, despicable, hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of any works of righteousness, righteousness that we had done, but it, according to God's mercy, through the water of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. This spirit God poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, having been justified by God's grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is sure. I desire that you insist on these things, so that those who have come to believe in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable to everyone. But avoid stupid controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. God's blessings for God's people. Amen. Good morning, boys and girls. This is the time for our children's lesson. 
And this week, one of the special helpers in our church, Ingrid Boone, gave me a list of all the people who attend our church when we're attending church. And uh, I was reading through them, and this list not only gave names and numbers, it showed whether they were baptized in the church, baptized members or not. And most of the people who were not baptized members were children and teenagers. And I started thinking, wow, I wonder whether they know they've been invited to follow Jesus in baptism. In the scripture that Reverend Cheryl just read, it talked about God pouring out God's love and that we've been refreshed and renewed by the water of God. That refers to something we do. That refers to baptism. This water here is from the baptistry. I got it this morning and you can see it here. And when people want to be baptized, uh, we don't just pour the water over them. Uh, we dunk them in that tub up here all the way under. And you say, well, why on earth would you do a thing like that? Well, uh, for most of you, the vast majority of you, uh, your parents brought you to this church or to some other church that they belonged to at the time. When you were born, you didn't even know where you were. You were just in their arms and kind of babbling around. And they held you up and they dedicated themselves to raising you in the church, to bringing you to church, to telling you about Jesus, to reading you Bible stories. And that's why they brought you to church all those years. You know, you sometimes wonder, why do we have to go to church? Well, they made a promise to God, and they were going to fulfill that promise to the very best of their ability. But at some point, every person gets old enough that that promise the parents made for them, uh, it's time for that person to make a promise. That promise your parents made only took you for a few a few years. Then you get to a point where you have to decide for yourself, do I now promise to follow God and to love God and to serve God with my life? And when you're ready to do that, then we're ready to talk with you about baptism. And maybe some of you are ready, some of you teenagers. You know, we have a nine-year-old boy waiting right now to be baptized. We can't baptize till this virus is gone, but he's waiting. And a 17-year-old boy is waiting and uh, one man got baptized in this church after he was 80 years old. He waited that long. You don't have to wait that long. When God calls you and you feel that you're ready now to make that promise to follow Jesus, have your parents call me. Or if you're a teenager, call me yourself. And we'll talk. And we'll get you ready so that you can make that promise to God. You can promise to follow Jesus. You can receive the Spirit of God. And you can become a follower of Jesus Christ. If anybody's ready to make that commitment, I hope you'll call me this week because that's my favorite thing in all of my ministry to do, to baptize people and to get them started in the walk to follow Jesus Christ. I hope you'll do that soon. I'll be praying for you. And when you're ready, you let me know. Let's have a prayer together. Dear Jesus, we thank you for dying on the cross and being raised from the dead so that we can put our faith in you you are certainly worthy. Help us when we're ready to make that promise, not to be afraid and not to postpone it, but to make that promise to you to do our best to follow you and to be baptized to show the whole world that we're ready to follow you. When that time has come, let us know in our hearts and we shall follow you. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord.
Oh, yeah.
Thank you, Tomi Niolua. It's always nice to have you bless us with that, and that was a blessing. Last week I was not here because I was doing a wedding, and I started that wedding by saying, uh, I know why the groom and the bride are here, I know why all the family and friends are here, but why am I here? Uh, and they didn't have a good answer, but I had one, because you know these days you can be married by your cousin or the postal director or anybody that walks by. You can get something off of the internet and marry somebody in this country. But uh, the reason I was there is I brought the blessing. I didn't create the blessing. I just pronounced the blessing. And I would not want to start a marriage without the blessing of God that uh, we just heard today. Among people, uh, I guess from the beginning of time. Uh, are we good? Basically good, created good, and we just get off the path? Or are we basically bad and need a lot of restrictions and changes and uh, management? Uh, the biggest debate on this subject happened back in the 17th century between two Englishmen. And you probably remember their names. You probably had to study a little bit about them in school. I just want you to know not only will this not be on the test, there won't be a test. But these two names are important in our history, John Locke and Thomas Hobbes. John Locke believed that all people were good. They were innately good. And he believed that you just needed to remove the restrictions that people live under, uh, and that if you remove those restrictions, gave them freedom, they would choose to do the right thing. He didn't believe in an authoritarian government at all. He believed that people needed to be free. He said they need to be free to pursue life, to pursue liberty, to proceed health, and then Jefferson said uh, to pursue the pursuit of happiness, but uh, John Locke said that uh, also need to be able to pursue property. So we like that, don't we? So he said if you take the restrictions off, people will pursue those things, liberty, life, health, and property, and they'll do it well. They'll do the right thing. You don't need to give them a lot of restrictions. Thomas Hobbes, on the other hand, he believed that people were innately bad. They were rebellious and evil, and they didn't want to do the right thing. And he believed you needed an authoritarian government to pass strong laws and enforce them to keep people in check. Now, both John Locke and Thomas Hobbes had the, uh, I guess, the privilege, the convenience of being uh, only in theory. They just came up with theories. They didn't have to apply them. But their followers through the years have tried to uh, apply those theories. Uh, and and our, our basic two political streams in this country, they, they get their origin among these two men. John Locke is usually seen as the father of liberalism. And so folks who believe he's right, they tend to want lots of freedoms in this country and in all countries. They fight for the freedom of speech, the freedom of religion, the freedom of the press, the freedom to assemble, the freedom to demonstrate, the freedom to vote, all those freedoms. And they don't want any restrictions on those freedoms because they believe that people are innately good. And if you take those freedoms off of them, they will do the right thing. Now, in our modern day, they even go as far as to say they don't want any restrictions on uh, abortion or on recreational use of drugs, or they don't want the government to tell them who has to be in the military and who, who doesn't have to be in the military. Uh, they, some, they don't want the government to tell them who you can marry and who you cannot marry, and on and on it goes. Remove all those restraints, they say, and people will do the right thing because they're innately good. And they believe that until it comes to money. Now, when it comes to money, the liberals say, well, no, if you, no. <laughs> You can't go that far. Uh, you're going to have to force people to do the right thing with some of their money uh, because they will not voluntarily contribute to the common good. So you've got to force them to do so. We call those taxes. And so the taxes have become part of that as well. And also, uh, when it comes to business, they don't believe that in business people will voluntarily do the right thing. Uh, so they have a strong admonition to pass laws that force people uh, to do equal hiring, equal uh, public accommodations, serve all people equally, uh, give housing to all people equally, and do not discriminate based on race, creed, color, or sexual orientation. They don't think people will do the right thing in business, and they don't think people will do the right thing with their money, but everywhere else they think they would do the right thing. The Hobbesians are on the other side of the fence. They like strong laws. Uh, they want crimes and misdemeanors uh, punished. 
They want abortion outlawed. They want uh, the government to tell you who you can marry and who you can't marry. They want uh, laws enforcing uh, laws about the use of drugs. Uh, and on and on and on it goes. They like law and order. That's a big deal with them uh, until it comes to money. And then they say, no, 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 get out of our business. <laughs> we'll handle our money just fine. We don't want any taxes and we don't want any regulations. We want to be able to serve who we want to serve, hire who we want to hire, a house who we want to hire. Leave it up to us. We'll do the right thing. Uh, the Second Amendment is another thing. No, uh, we can handle guns all right. Uh, some of these other things, we may need some restrictions on speech and the press and the power to assemble and all of that. But on these things, people will do the right thing. You see, it's impossible to be consistent with this. It's not a reliable truth either way. And the Bible teaches us that. You say, well, is the Bible Lockean or Hobbesian? Well, it's neither. It starts off looking like it might be a liberal tradition. You know how we were created. The Bible says that God put together some dust and then breathed the breath of God into us. So that means we're all both divinity and dust. We, we've got God in us, but we've got other stuff. G uh, Genesis says that we were created in the image of God. That's got to be good, doesn't it? And it also says that after everybody was created, the first human beings, that God looked down and he said, now this, meaning us, is very good. That sounds like he's a Lockean, but not so fast. Because before the paint was even dried on uh, we created beings, you had Adam and Eve accusing each other and disobeying God and turning on one another and lying. And, and then you got Cain and Abel and they're fussing and fighting. Then Cain kills Abel. I mean, we don't even get through three chapters of the Bible and we're a mess. We get kicked out of the garden and we're banned from paradise. And then you get into the prophets and Jeremiah says, the heart of all human beings is deceitful and desperately wicked. And Isaiah comes along and says, even our most righteous deeds are like filthy rags in the sight of God. And then Jesus steps in and says, why do you even call me good? There's nobody good except for God. And in the second chapter of John, it tells us Jesus did not trust himself to anyone because he knew what was in the heart of everyone and knew they could not be trusted. Ah, then you get into Paul. Paul says, there are no, no righteous, no, not one. He said, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then in the seventh chapter, he says, even he... Even he who believed in Jesus couldn't always get himself to do the right thing, even when he knew what the right thing was. So, does Scripture believe that we are basically good and get corrupted? Does Scripture believe we're basically evil? What does the Scripture say? We're not really here to study John Locke or Thomas Hobbes. We're here to try to find out what the scripture teaches us about our nature. And we get some help in that, again, from Paul's letter to Titus. Now, a few weeks ago, we looked at another portion of scripture from Titus, and there we learned that Titus was a pastor on the island of Crete, and that Paul sent him to Crete because he had special gifts in dealing with conflict and, and disagreeable people. And he sent him to Crete because Crete was known throughout the world as one of the most violent, disagreeable, hateful, wild, and difficult places on earth. In fact, the word Cretan came to symbolize somebody who was uncivilized, who was immoral, who was violent. So Paul sent Titus into that very difficult place to start a church. And when he sent him, he said, now listen, the only way you're going to have any effect on them is you're going to have to preach them the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're going to have to get that gospel into them. And then that gospel will do its work. Nothing less will be able to transform those people. They're rough as they come. And so Paul told him, there's three things I want you to include in your message to this new place that you're being sent. These three things have the potential to transform them. He said, I want you to tell them that they all have the same past. And then I want you to tell them that they now all have the same possibility. And then I want you to tell them if they take that possibility, they all have the same potential. Now, we're in the middle of a sermon series called, What Can I Do? 
And it's all about what we can do in our lives to make some impact on the world. We know these huge, enormous problems, we're not big enough to handle all of them, but can't we do something? And the answer has been yes, we can do something. And one of the things that Christians can do is to share the gospel with people. Uh, we can tell them this. And so I, I've sort of packaged this in a way that you might can remember. Uh, the gospel can be expressed this way. We all have the same past. And today we all have the same wonderful possibility. And if we take that possibility, then we all have a wonderful potential. Let's break that down a little bit. I hope you'll share this with somebody. Maybe you know somebody who needs this today. And uh, I want you to be able to talk about it. You know, very rarely do we get a chance to do the whole gospel in one setting. You have to do it kind of when you have a chance. Put it in here and there with a coworker or a friend or a family member. I do find family members are really hard for us to share the faith with. After they reach a certain age, we have to start out early. Uh, but down the road, it's hard because uh, they get to that point is how can I be me if I believe everything you believe? I can't be me if I believe everything you believe, so I'm going to reject some of what you believe. And you need some good soul sometime to come in there and share the gospel with them in a new way. Maybe you'll get that chance with somebody. Here's the three things. Tell them that we all share the same past. That's what Paul told Titus. Now listen to what he says. Very important. He says, we all, not just you, not just bad folk, not just the people we don't like, we all, we all, we all have come from a time when we made foolish decisions, he said. Now to make a foolish decision means you know you have a choice. If not, you're a victim. If not, you're a robot. You're oppressed. We do have free choice. He said, there was a time when we were good. Uh, when, you know, think of a baby. Rocking that baby, goo goo gaga. -ga. That's a beautiful thing. You can't look at the face of a baby and say, you see evil, you see nothing but good. That's how we all started out. Sitting on granny's knee, hanging out. We were just beautiful little creatures. The image of God was just radiating out of us. But Paul said, some point along the way, we started getting off track. And one of the things we did is make foolish choices. We had options, but we took the wrong one. Can you think of a bad option you've taken in your life? I'll give you a little longer. Can you think of it yet? Okay, all right, we're all on the same page. See, we all have that same past. And then he said we were all disobedient. Again, that means we knew the right thing. We heard the voice of God. We had a moral compass. It was told to us. We knew right from wrong, but we disobeyed. We didn't want to do it that way. And we went in a different direction. Everybody, he says, has been disobedient. And then Paul said we were all led astray. Now, by definition, to be led astray, you have to be on the right path to begin with. And then somebody comes along and they say, oh, it's more fun over here, or you got to try this, or life is found in this direction. And we are allow ourselves to be led astray. Not just some of us, all of us. And then he says that we became slave to our own passions and pleasures. See, when you're led astray, that's somebody outside of you coming along and say, let's go this direction. But the passions and pleasures, they come from in here. Uh, there's an old country song that said, I don't pray, Lord, don't lead me into temptation. I know the way all by myself. I don't need anybody to lead me. That's those slaves, that's those passions inside of us. And they take us in the wrong direction. Uh, some of us get caught up in drinking and drugging. We try it. Some folks try it, find it great. They go that way for a while. Some folks uh, mess around sexually. They like it for a while. Some folks get a little cash and they want more of it, more of it, and pretty soon they've given their soul over to that. Uh, there's all sorts of things that we get involved with, and some of them are not inherently bad, but if they come to rule our lives instead of God, those passions and pleasures take us away from God. They corrupt us. Um, you know, I, I've known folks that live nothing, uh, live for sports. I don't think sports in themselves are anything wrong, but I know people, they don't do anything else but watch the next sporting event. Uh, there, you could go on and on with this. He says the passions get a hold of us, and they take us in the wrong direction. Uh, and, and he lists all these things, foolish choices, being disobedient, being led astray, our own passions. And then he said we get into this stuff where we are hateful. He says we're despicable. That's pretty rough. 
Uh, and then he goes on and says that like, we have envy and malice, and it's just an all messed up thing. Now, he wants us to understand that the people in Crete, now you and I read about the people in Crete, so well, of course, they had it. No, Paul didn't say just the Cretans had it. He said we all have the same past. We share the same past. We're born and we get corrupted. We fall away. We do the wrong thing. Church of Jesus Christ, the fatal flaw we keep making is we keep pronouncing to the world that we're good and they're bad. That we got it all straightened out and they got it all messed up. And, and that uh, we don't know anything about that sinful stuff. Maybe we read about it in a book or heard about it from a friend, but we never had any first-hand buy it. Let me tell you something. Nobody's buying that anymore. If they ever bought it, they're not buying that anymore. What Paul told them to say is, admit it, admit it, Titus, admit it. We all have the same shared past. We started out as babies with goodness, but we got off the track. We got all messed up. And now our lives have been messed up and maybe our lives are currently messed up. If your life is just a mess right now, I hope you'll listen to what the next part of this is. You already know that we have a shared past. You already know that things can get messed up. But how about the next part? Then Paul says, but tell them this. Don't leave them with the shared past. Let them know that we all have a shared possibility. And that possibility is salvation in the name of Jesus Christ. He says, because God in God's goodness and loving kindness had mercy upon us and sent Jesus to tell us the truth. And to all who believe in Christ, he says, he pours out the Holy Spirit upon them and gives them new birth. All of that is in this one passage. This is a beautiful passage to share with anybody. Because he says, it just came upon us. God gave us a new possibility. I say possibility because not everybody takes it. Some people want to last a little bit longer out there uh, in the before, <laughs> in the past. Okay? There was an old uh, evangelist who became corrupt in his later years. Maybe he was always corrupt, I don't know. But he used to say, if you don't think sin's fun, you haven't found the right sin yet. So the Bible says there is pleasure in all of that stuff, but it's only pleasure for a season. It runs out. Maybe you're still in the season uh, and you're still dabbling with air. I want you to know you have a possibility to be transformed, to change, to receive the salvation of God, to have a new birth to start over. Some people are ready to grasp that possibility. Some people don't. But the possibility is for everyone. Paul said that. He said it's, the possibility isn't based on our own righteousness or our own good deeds. If it were, then only some people could have that possibility. See, the people who were good. I find in our politics and our religion and everything else, it, it comes down to this. I don't need any restrictions for myself because I'm basically good. But boy, we need them for you because you're a problem. Uh, you got some bad stuff going on. We need to restrict you, but let me alone. No, 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 no. Paul says there is nobody good. And it's not because of our righteousness. It's because of God's great mercy and loving kindness that is poured out on us. In the young adult Bible study last week, we read the word that there was a cataract. And we thought, well, what's wrong with your eyes? But that's not the cataract it was meaning. A huge waterfall of God's love just pours out on us. That's the new possibility. And if we receive that love, repent of the old past and receive the spirit, the Bible says we have a new birth if we take that possibility. And the possibility is for you, no matter how messy your life is or how straightened it is, it is for us all. And then if we take that possibility, Paul says we have a new potential. And he describes that potential as that we become inheritors of eternal life. That's really important. Because before we take that new possibility, we think there is only this life. And we think we're only going to inherit in this life. And that makes everything in this life so important to us. We've got to have money. We've got to have security. We've got to have pleasure. We've got to have convenience. We've got to have security. We've got to fight for it. We've got to get it. We've got to accumulate it. We've got to put it in the bank. We've got to cover it up. It's all about this world. And we become highly anxious people. Anxiety is absolutely the most chronic disease of our time. Because we've got to hang on to everything. But Paul said, once you take that new possibility and you receive Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit comes into your life, 
then you realize I got a new potential. I'm going to inherit eternal life. I'm going to inherit eternal love, eternal peace, eternal serenity, eternal, eternal joy, eternal thanksgiving, and, e and an eternal home with God. And when you get that settled in your heart, see, oh, you can breathe again. You can relax again. Yeah, we're going to have some stuff here. We've got to have a few things to get through this life. But it's not this life only for which we live. We live with our eyes on the prize. We live with our eyes that we are inheritors of all things eternal that come from God. We all share the same past. And we all share the same possibility. And if we take it, then we all share a new potential. Isn't that good news? I think it's good news for anybody. It was good news for Dorothy Day. I've been talking a lot about Dorothy Day. I've been reading so much about her lately. She's really had an impact on my life. As a child, Dorothy Day loved the Bible. She loved to go to Mass. She loved to uh, think about God and pray. In fact, her mother was worried about her. Her, her dad didn't understand her at all. He was a sports writer, and he thought, this, this girl needs help. But her mother thought she may be coming one of these fringe religious fanatics, and she worried about her. And, and, and Dorothy hung in there, but when she became about 13, Dorothy started getting very fearful of life. She was fearful that she was going to be annihilated by, by the world, and that she started being afraid of God, and she started running from God. And she left home at a very young age. She eventually ended up in Greenwich Village and she hobnobbed with the bohemian culture of the 1920s and early 30s where anything was sort of permissible. Eugene O'Neill, the great playwright, he knew her. He said she could drink any man in the world under the table. He said she just drank, 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 drank. He didn't know how anybody kept up with her. She spent most of her nights at a bar called the Bucket of Blood. Now that doesn't sound like a real wholesome place to hang out, does it? <laughs> That's where she was. And then she began to take on lots of different lovers. She became pregnant. She sought out and received an abortion from a friend. Uh, that abortion, she thought, destroyed her ability to have children. She went on and had multiple other lovers. She had many different jobs. She may have been a, a sex worker for a short period of time. That part is a little hazy. Uh, but she was definitely involved in a lot of things that were detrimental and destructive. She finally got involved with, uh, she finally got married. She tried to shape herself up, so she married some guy she didn't love. They went on a honeymoon. When she got back, she took the ring off, put it on a table, and left, never to see him again. Then she got involved with yet another man, and she got pregnant. She didn't think she could get pregnant, but she did. And she wrote that when she gave birth and held that baby in her arms, it was like a dam of God's love burst and it just flooded her heart and she could remember all the things she felt as a child. It all came back to her. And she went out and found a friend who was a Catholic nun, Sister Aloysius, and she said, I want to baptize my baby so my baby can know the things that I knew. And the sister said, no way. I'm not baptizing that baby till you get your life straightened out. And so Dorothy Day, she began to go come back to God. She was converted. She studied and she went to Mass and she read the scripture and she prayed and she was baptized. And she baptized that child. And she gave the rest of her life in service to Jesus Christ. She started multiple homes for poor people, 200 of which are still in existence around the world. She published a newspaper to help people who were very low income and workers who were not treated rightly. And she charged one penny for that newspaper back in 1934. But today you can still buy that same newspaper for a penny. You have to pay postage, which is a lot more than a penny, but you can get the newspaper for a penny. She gave her whole life the service of God, even to such a degree that this year, the Catholic Church began the process of making Dorothy Day an official saint of the church. Now, I know we Baptists, we don't put much stock in all that saint stuff, but what a life, what a transformation. A woman who understood she had a common past with everyone, and she was received a new possibility of God's loving kindness. And she took it when it came her way. And it transformed her life to give her a whole new potential. The same thing can happen to you. The same thing can happen to me. We just have to trust in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Won't you give it another chance in your life today? 
Won't you give it one more chance? Won't you try sharing it with somebody in some way in the coming days? You can do that. I can do that. We can do that. And who knows? But the loving kindness of God might become apparent to somebody we love even today if we're faithful to share it. Would you join me in prayer? Oh God, thank you for the gospel that was shared with me and for those in this room. Thank you that we heard it from somewhere, someplace, that we didn't stay in that common past, but in fact we heard and believed in your loving kindness. We received the Spirit of God. We were transformed. And now we're not perfect. We're a long way from it. And we stumble around, but we have a whole new potential to be fully people who live in service to you, to your glory, in love with you, in service to you, fully created in the image of God, reborn in that image. We thank you for that. And may we share that good news with all that we come in contact with whenever given an opportunity to do so. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. I'm going to read uh, our confession and assurance of pardon today. It says, God of eternal salvation, forgive us for underestimating the power of conversion for all people. Renew our joy in sharing the good news of your gospel with the people of our lives. Amen. We're going to sing a song, We've Come This Far by Faith. I hope you'll join in and sing along. is the first Sunday of the month and in our church worship we take communion the first Sunday of the month so you may want to put this on pause for a second and go and find uh, some uh, elements to take some juice some crackers uh, we'll take it together here uh, but this now we welcome you to the table of our Lord and we invite any believer in Jesus Christ to take communion with us today uh, and the elements don't have to be the same as those here they're just symbols of God's presence. Although God is here and God is in them, uh, you don't have to have anything specially blessed by me in our tradition. Uh, we just take it in faith and in thanksgiving to our God. Uh, so in just a moment, we'll go ahead and, uh, uh, well, I think we have to do that right now, in fact. So I'm going to invite anyone that wants to take communion to come and take one of these cups and uh, the wafer is in the cup so that you can 
take it with us. I don't know, do we have music today for this? No, we're going to do this in silence today. All right. Uh, so at this point, if anyone would like to take communion in this place, there's a few people here. We invite you to come and take the, the elements, and then I will read and we will take it together. So please come now if you'd like to do that. And I'll be reading today from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. As I read, please come to the table and take the cup if you would like to. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread, and when given thanks he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup also after the supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So I invite you first to take the wafer. This represents Christ's presence with us. We take this today in thanksgiving to Jesus Christ as we eat this in honor of him. And as the scripture said, in like manner, Jesus gave him the cup, said, this is the new covenant in my blood. And we take this cup in great gratitude and in pledging our lives to the one who died for us. We take this cup together. Now, if this was a Sunday where we were gathering, the children would have come to this aisle and received a blessing from Pastor Kenny. We already talked about how important blessing is. And Pastor Kenny's gonna come and give them, uh, the children of our church, a blessing before we sing our hymn of benediction. We want to let all the children know that you're blessed. We ask you to know that you're loved and that someone cares, not only your parents, but a loving, caring God. Amen. 